everyone, it's Jesse from Bear Flower Farm. Today I'm coming to you with a topic that ended up being my most popular video so far. So I'm going to be talking about the most and least profitable flowers that I grew in my second year of flower farming. So for those of you who are new to my channel, my name is Jesse. I live in zone 6B in New Jersey and this is my second year of flower farming. Now, even though it was my second year of flower farming, I had very different goals, we'll call it, than in my first year. And that is going to significantly impact the types of flowers and crops that make it onto my list this year. In fact, we have basically a completely different list and there are even flowers that made it onto the most profitable part of the list last year that now have made it to the bottom of the list and i will talk about why so i think this video is relevant for any flower farmer out there because the intent of it isn't to say hey this is profitable for me so therefore you should grow it this is really more of a discussion around what makes something profitable for me given my objectives what i'm trying to achieve and my current personal life situation that might force me to farm a different way than you so again this is a side hustle for me i don't do this full time if i was doing this full time my objectives would obviously look very different where i grow how i grow and what i choose to focus on in terms of my sales outlets will also make a significant impact too now i do want to level set by just defining what do we mean by profitability here? And in the flower farming world, you typically see people talk about productivity per square foot. Uh, I will say that I was not as great this year when it came to keeping track of my harvesting data, meaning I didn't uh, try to keep track of, hey, how many stems did I harvest off of this plant or in a square foot area? And that's because I didn't actually grow a lot of annuals that were cut and come again. I did have some spring crops that were cut and come again, but those are a little bit different than things like zinnias or cosmos where you'll get a lot of that. Now I did grow dahlias, which is definitely cut and come again. I think next year I'm going to try to do a better job of getting how many stems I get off of each uh, square foot or plant. But for the most part, I have high level of good idea of what varieties were the most productive and workhorses for me. So for the purposes of this discussion, I'm talking more about profitability from the standpoint of how much did I make in revenue? And I'm going to break it down to you based off of retail versus wholesale. And then what were my costs associated with it? I'm not going to embed my cost of labor here as a numerical number, but I will reference it in terms of how much effort I put in for labor when it came to planting, harvesting, uh, making arrangements, meaning prepping the stem. So all of that will be more anecdotal. It's not yet in a number, which I hope in the future I can get to, but this year I just didn't have the capacity to really keep track of every single moment when I was spending on a particular crop. Now, another thing to talk about is just sales outlets. So in my first year, I predominantly sold at a farmer's market every other weekend, and it was my first year, so I didn't have an established clientele, which meant that I didn't really have a lot of room for a la carte bouquets. So outside of those farmer's markets, I did sell some a la carte bouquets, but mostly through Facebook Marketplace. In year two, I was selective in terms of which weekends I appeared at that farmer's market. I do have a relationship with the market manager where she allowed me to attend as I wanted, and sometimes she would even call me to attend if the other landscape vendor that did bring cut flowers called out. So I had flexibility on that front. I got a lot more a la carte bouquet sales just because I was a little bit more established in my community. And then I also had a CSA, which was pretty huge, especially in the early spring to we'll call it midsummer. And then last but not least, I did expand to wholesale selling to florists through primarily a co-op. I did sell to another local florist here and there, but most of my florist sales were through this co-op where we get together once a week and we come together as a group to sell collectively to many florists. So it's a win-win on both fronts because we as individual growers don't have enough for all the florists and 
more florists can come in to then collectively buy from us. Now, the reason why I bring up these sales outlets is not only is it going to impact the amount that you make, because obviously wholesale stems are going to fetch less dollar amount than retail stems, but the types of crops that I would grow because I was focusing a little bit more on wholesale dictated what crops I put into the ground. And even though wholesale was still less than my retail, I was already shifting my thinking towards if I'm gonna grow like 80% for wholesale, what does that look like? And I wanted to make sure I had the experience this year to carry forward for next year. Now, I know you're probably just saying, get on with it, what's the list? I promise this context is really important as foundation before I get to list. So the one other thing I wanna talk about is just what was I trying to accomplish in terms of my objectives this year? So. If you haven't been following, one of the major things that happened to us personally was we had a baby. We had a baby earlier in the season, uh, in March, and that obviously, I knew I was having a baby nine months before then. Uh, that led to a lot of planning for us, meaning I knew I wanted to overwinter spring crops, get that early spring flush, and then not really focus on summer annuals. I would still grow summer crops, but I would focus on Focals, and I wanted to make sure that I was growing something that could be a predominant focal. So this is where things like dahlias and lilies come into play. So a priority was planting things that had one, a shorter lead time, two, things that I could in some ways predict predictably uh, anticipate when they would bloom and three, have secessions of it. So things that really fit into that category are bulbs. So unfortunately you can't really grow tulips outside of, I would say after like Mother's Day at the latest because uh, the bulbs just aren't gonna, like there's no supplier that's gonna be able to hold bulbs that long enough for you to be able to do that. But lilies are a bit of a different story because lilies can actually technically be grown all year around, assuming you can fake winter. It comes from the supplier, uh, thawed, so that's winter. And then as long as you can replicate spring and late spring, early summer conditions, the lilies can hypothetically grow. There are people who can actually grow lilies all year around. They're just limited by when they can sell it because at the height of winter it is too cold to transport lily blooms and what happens is that those blooms get bruised and basically it's really hard to make it to the customer's uh, house without the, the the blooms basically degrading from the cold so for that reason lilies are actually a really long crop that you can secession plant over time and that's why i prioritize growing them so i had a lot of starts out in the field for uh, from last late last summer fall that basically grew in the spring um, and these are cold loving type of flowers that could potentially give me a second flush and we'll talk about how that potentially actually negatively impacted uh, some decisions that I made that led to a loss. All right, so without further ado, let's get going. So I'm actually only gonna talk about four crops that landed in my profitability bucket. The first crop is lilies. Now that might surprise some of you because I technically set out to grow a lot more tulips than I did lilies. And the reason why lilies were on top was because I simply had less attrition with lilies. I think that lilies as a whole are just less of a tricky crop to try to force than something like tulips. Um, and even though I was growing lilies at the height of the summer, like not necessarily trying to get them bloom to bloom during the height of summer, but trying to replicate those spring temperatures at the height of the summer for late summer, early fall blooms, uh, sometimes that didn't work out for me. But even with that attrition, I still definitely made a profit off them. So I sold about $2,200 in lilies alone, and that breakout comes out to about $650 to florists and $1,550 to retail customers. Uh, I would say that I gave away a lot of lilies. Uh, I gave away a lot of lilies to daycare teachers as well as coworkers, neighbors. There were just times when it was hard for me to punt off lilies. And that is the drawback of lilies, which is that 
fewer people honestly like lilies. There is still a huge association of lilies with the fragrance that they have, especially with funeral homes, even though nowadays there are uh, bread lilies that are non-scented. And I would say that until I started growing those non-fragrant lilies that came in the late summer, fall time period, that was when I was able to actually turn the tide with a lot more retail customers. So for example, my last farmer's market on November 6th, uh, I actually did a video on it, was powered by lilies. I predominantly had basically like 80% lilies. I was able to harvest foliage from dahlias, tomatoes, and get some straw flower and celosia before the frost hit and wiped everything out. But most of my bouquets definitely had lilies or were just lilies. And you could tell at the booth when people came in and they're like, oh, I don't smell anything. And I would lead with, hey, these are non-fragrant, non-scented lilies. It really caught their eye or caught their attention because they're like, oh, I didn't realize that that could happen, that those even existed. So there were definitely people who wouldn't have bought those bouquets who bought because they were non-scented. So all this to say, I think there's a lot more opportunity for opportunity for lilies they were definitely a bit more of a harder sell for the florists i did have some florists who were converted even with the ot's which are the scented lilies especially the double ot's aka rose lilies now I would say that lilies as a whole from a labor intensity perspective were not super labor intensive because I grew them in crates. So I am for the most part treating the lilies as an annual and then uh, getting rid of that crate. So because they're grown in crates, I use my own homemade compost. For the most part, I didn't have weeds. When I had weeds, they were actually welcome weeds because I got celosia, I got amaranth, I got random stuff from there that I dumped out into a pile last year. So you can tell that the pile didn't get hot enough because I got weeds out of them. But for the most part, uh, they were like weed free. They were easy to grow. And when I was done, I would just cart the crate out in a wheelbarrow and dump them over. And the good news is that for the later secessions, I might actually be able to get a second flush out of them because what I'm doing is uh, I cut them with a third of the stem left, some leaves, hoping that they will regenerate. And then I'll put the crates to the side and see if I can get a second flush out of them. Um, so from a labor perspective, relatively easy to plant, didn't have a lot of weeding. I'm going to be talking a lot about weeding because that was super, um, I weeded a lot this year is the point. And that is definitely a consideration when it comes to the cost labor intensity perspective. Um, so then I would also say that harvesting lilies is super, super quick because you literally just snip and you take off all the leaves and then you put into a bucket and they're also long lasting, which also is an intangible that is hard to put a number on, right? Like I held lilies in the refrigerator for like three weeks for a wedding and there's no way I could have fulfilled that DIY bucket wedding. It was like four buckets without those lilies. Um, so the other thing about lilies was that it was just a reliable focal that I could always rely on. I had lilies from June all the way till November. What other reliable focal is going to get you that? So a lot of intangibles that puts it at the top of my list. Uh, and I would say that from a cost perspective, I feel like that there is still room for me to lower the cost. I really got killed in shipping costs because I was shipping one crate at a time and it came from California. Um, it came from Ownings in California, even though they have in a place in Edison, which is literally about like 25 minutes away from me. Uh, but for the varieties and the quantity I was buying, they only ship from California. So I paid about $1,110 in the cost of bulbs alone and i got two thousand two hundred dollars back and that is basically a two to one return so we're talking about for every one dollar that i put in i got two dollars back so paid for the cost and i got an extra dollar not fantastic in the cut flower world because if you start from seed you could probably get a much better roi but really good from the perspective that i never felt like i had to say no to an a la carte request even at a time when I was busy with work when I was deprioritizing the farm. I always felt like I had uh, a reliable focal and I could throw together other stuff that was growing in smaller quantities to make a bouquet. And that is something that I cannot discount. So lilies are at the top of the list and you bet I will be doing more lilies next year. The next crop on my list is tulips. 
So I sold $3,400 of tulips this year. And I say this year because I actually sold some in December of 2022 that didn't make it onto the list. I got my first winter tulips in mid-December, which was a little bit crazy. This year, I might even be getting my winter tulips in early December, which is a little bit too early, but that's okay. So when you break down the $3,400, uh, we're looking at just $400 to florists because my co-op didn't start until uh, April 1st. Uh, and then I sold the rest to retail. And of that, what that was $1,600 worth of winter tulips in the first quarter. So Mar uh, January through March and another 1410 worth of, win uh, of field grown tulips. And that basically happened during the month of April when everything came in at the same time. Now, the problem with tulips is that I would say that winter tulips are very profitable and the field grown tulips were not at all profitable, even though from a number standpoint, I technically made money on paper. The labor of field grown tulips completely outweighed anything. And I would say that they were a loss, but most of my sales came from, I would say winter tulips and the amount of uh, advertising that I got from winter tulips made them profitable. So again, another intangible that you cannot avoid there. And also winter grown tulips, have a very, very high productivity per square foot. I mean, we're talking about 80 tulips ish in a hydroponic tray. I could fit three trays onto one shelf rack and then each shelf I could fit nine trays total minimum. So you're talking about like, like what is that 90 times or 80 times nine, that's 720 tulips ish in this small area. So productivity is really high and it's a matter of attrition when it comes to winter tulips. I had a lot more attrition later in the season because I was not able to sufficiently store the bulbs dry to a state where um, they wouldn't rot before they they grew. So I feel a lot more confident this year going into the winter season to be able to force later tulips. Um, the other thing is from just a labor perspective, uh, I, I started talking about how field grown tulips were a lot more labor intensive. The reason why they were so labor intensive was because I did the trench method in a heavy clay soil type of area. And what that meant was that when I pulled the stem, I was trying to pull it with the bulb. Sometimes the stem would snap off and it took me a lot of time to to go back and dig out the bulb and there were like i remember in early june i was still trying to dig out those bulbs and that was post c-section weeks post c-section it was just not something fun to do but i did it because if you keep the bulb in there you risk basically foliage coming up in the spring and making that bed almost um almost like like non-usable uh, because you are gonna have foliage coming up. So I wanna make sure that all those bulbs were gone. So for the most part, I would say that that the tulips last year made me money because I got local press for my winter tulips. And that local press really helped help me get the awareness of Bear Flower Farm out there to my local community. It got me CSA members that came back again and again. It got me a la carte bouquets for Valentine's Day. And so in some ways, tulips were a loss lead for me. So tulips cost me $2,300 in the form of bulbs. I grossed $3,400 back. That's about a 48% margin. You add in the labor in there between winter and field grown. It's basically a wash, if not negative, but it was a profitable loss lead for me because it let people know I had tulips. It was something different that no one else was doing. So a local paper wanted to cover that. And at the end of the day, it got me a lot more customers earlier who ended up coming to me repeatedly. The next crop on my list is a popular one and it is dahlias. So I hate to say this, but I didn't take dahlias se seriously even this year. I actually wasn't even planning on growing dahlias last year or this year. There's a fellow YouTube viewer, yes, that's you, Monica, who just graciously sent me a box of tubers last year as like a thank you for all of my YouTube videos. And because of her, I grew dahlias. And then I had another friend uh, who basically started selling dahlia tubers and was like, I'm gonna sell you these tubers. 
and you're not going to regret growing them and buying them. And she was right because dahlias are one of the most popular crops with florists, especially at the co-op. Somehow I got some of my dahlias earlier than some of the other growers. So that's where I made a lot of my dahlia money, but I also put them in a ton of retail bouquets because dahlias just keep on coming if you cut and come again. Now I probably only grew about call it like 30 plants and I felt like I was consistently cutting off of about two dozen of those. Of those two dozen there were a select few that were workhorses and there were a select few that appealed to both retail and florists. So I'll give you an example. The ones that appeal to both sides are like peaches and cream. I didn't grow that one, but other growers did. And that one does really well on both sides. I grew a uh, Cornell bronze, which did really well both sides. And of course that one has a much better vase life. So that gives you a confidence boost when you're putting it into retail bouquets. I also grew Jowie Winnie uh, appeals to both sides, grew Polka appeals to both sides. Things that only appeal to like retail were Diva. Um, Diva is highly productive, which is why I would grow it again. But there was a red one that I grew that was that did well retail, but didn't really do well on the florist side. So I don't know if I'm going to grow that one again next year. I really want to prioritize the, the varieties that are heavy hitting on both fronts or that are super, super productive. Another one that I probably, I don't know if I'll grow this is uh, Pineland Princess, super productive, does well in retail because it's such a big bloom head and it's such a focal in a bouquet, but I don't know if people actually loved it or they just bought the bouquet because it was a mixed bouquet, but we'll see how the tubers do there. So when you break down my sales, it was $500 to retail and about $220 to florists. And the number for the florists probably could have been higher. I just didn't show up to the later markets because one, work got super busy and two, the baby went through a severe sleep regression where I was waking up like four times a night and that just did not make sense to me to wake up so early on a Wednesday morning to go to market, drive one hour south and then drive another hour and a half up north. It like that toll on my body just didn't seem safe to me even, right? I, I wouldn't wanna drive in that kind of situation. So I basically backed off of all co-op uh, sales after like mid-September. Um, and I would say from a cost perspective, when you put that into perspective, the dahlias were relatively profitable. I spent $110 in the tubers plus the free ones that I got. And that puts it at about a 550% margin. Now, when you take into account that dahlias also produce tubers, uh, you could potentially sell the tubers. I'm not doing that, but you can obviously double, if not triple your production of a single variety the year after it makes them even more profitable. That is offset, obviously, by the fact that they are quite labor intensive. Uh, if you are going to hold the tubers, you have to make sure you can hold them well over the winter. That is not always a given. So there is that piece that kind of offsets the the pod or the benefits of dahlias and the tubers reproducing. And then, of course, they spend a long time out in the field, right? You're getting them in like sometime in the early spring and they're not blooming until the late summer. But when they do bloom, they are productive per square foot, but they're of course taking up space uh, in a bed that you could probably flip multiple times with something like sunflowers. So that's just something for you to consider if you have a small space. Um, it kind of depends on what your objectives are. If you're looking to sell at a farmer's market every single week and you have limited space, you might only dedicate a very small portion of your land to dahlias because you're not gonna get that flush until much later in the season. And you might wanna intensively farm the areas or the small space that you have with something that is more quick turning, right? So that's what I'm saying. Like everyone's situation is gonna look super, super different. The last flower on my list is finally a crop that is not one that is a bulb or a tuber, and it is yarrow. So it should be no surprise to anyone who follows me, I fell in love with yarrow this year. Now, yarrow has so many benefits. It is a native, which means that it also uh, perennializes well. So sorry, like just because it's a native doesn't mean it perennializes, but it happens to be hardy down to my zone and lower. So it's native to a lot of areas, especially in the Northeast. Uh, there are different varieties that are native to different parts of the US. Sometimes you can even go forage yarrow. So yarrow is great from that perspective, but it's also got very small, flower heads and it's um, it's very easily accessible to pollinators and beneficials. So therefore it was like my source 
for ladybugs to reproduce on, which was awesome. I had so many beneficials because of the yarrow and even better, they will grow more vigorously next year. So I bought about 75 yarrow plugs from my local grower friend, Jess, who grew them for me, put them into the ground and I got, I, I made $500 from florists alone. I didn't keep track of what they were worth in my retail bouquets, but if I had a guess, it was probably around $100. So that is in the context of spending $33.18 on the plugs. So again, when you start something from seed and you get multiple stems off of it, that is a much better ROI because $33 in cost puts this at a 1700% return for year one. Year two, they're gonna divide more they're gonna get more vigorous tall blooms and I'm going to basically get revenue off of this for free plus labor. And then the other great thing about yarrow is that you can hypothetically divide it and put it somewhere else and that will grow into a robust plant. Now at a certain point, you will probably have to start more yarrow, but for I would say the next year or two, I should be good on yarrow. And yarrow did really, really well with florists. Now I have heard in certain areas, florists don't really care for yarrow, but in my area, florists cannot get enough of them. And the great part was I got, mul I got a second flush out of them. There's still yarrow going strong out there right now. It is November 11th today. So it's crazy that the yarrow is still pumping out blooms even even though it's not a ton. Um, so yarrow is definitely something I actually started more from seed of. I wanna put in more. It does great in landscaping because it is deer resistant. This is the one flower that I would definitely advise people to definitely have around. Um, it is a great filler and overall, it is just a great workhorse for everyone. And from a labor perspective, there's really not much to do. What I love about workhorse type of plants is that when they grow vigorously, they obviously suffocate out the weeds. So the weeds don't really have a chance to grow. That is a major factor for me because my biggest cost of labor is honestly weeding. So harvesting, planting pales in comparison to the time that you spend in weeding. And so if you have aggressive growing flower like yarrow, that eliminates the need to weed. So those were the four flowers that solidly made it onto the list. There are some honorable mention flowers out there that did well for me, have more potential for next year. Uh, one of them is Lysianthus. So that should also be no surprise to a lot of people. Lysianthus is just a very reliable focal. If you can grow it well, you will get multiple heads per stem. That makes it very reasonable for you to make a profit off of retail bouquets because you don't need a lot of stems for it to feel full. Florists will also be willing to pay the price that really you need in order for it to be a profitable crop. The, the offset of Lysianthus is that it is a longer lead time crop. You have to baby it. There's a lot of risk in the beginning for just rot when you first set it out. You might have to cover, uncover it. So you've got to balance that with just, again, uh, how big your space is, how much time you have to baby it. Um, and the reason why I didn't solidly make it on the list was because I did buy plugs at non-wholesale prices and quantities. So I spent, I think it was $230, no, $200 in plugs and I made about $350 back. So I still made some money, probably lost money with labor, but it was enough of sales where I am ordering two trays next year and I started some, or I'm going to start some from seed just to see um, if I can get the profitability up. Uh, another one on honorable mention is Silver Shield. So I actually did a flower farming science course on Silver Shield. It is one of those landscaping type of greens that should make it into your rotation if you're looking to stand out with a green that few other people are growing. So I sold $118 worth to florists off of like 12 plants. Uh, I already ordered a flat that is going to come with those Lysianthus trays next year. So that's over 100 Silver Shield. I think if I give them shade, they're going to produce longer stems and potentially give me a second flat. So I like Silver Shield just because it feels like it is a, it's like Coleus meets Dusty Miller in some ways. And so because I was the only one growing it, it also made it a lot easier to sell to florists. And it has a really long vase life because it roots in the water. So anything that starts rooting the water is obviously going to have a longer vase life than something that can't root. Another one on the list is Celosia. Celosia was also on my most profitable list last year. It remains this year because it's self-seeded everywhere. This stuff 
does so well as volunteers. I had like thousands of Celosia. I didn't pinch any of it. And because I didn't pinch any of it and it just continued to volunteer over and over, I had like secessions of it naturally. So I sold $118 of it to florists. I put them a lot in my retail bouquets. I didn't keep track of that. And because I didn't do any planting and it was kind of like self weeded in, in like, it was a weed in of itself that I could sell. Uh, I didn't spend a lot of time weeding and harvesting was obviously very easy. And of course, as you might know, Slosia is very good for drying. So even if you can't sell all of it at once, there's potential to dry it so that one stays on the list um last one on here is tomatoes uh tomatoes made it onto the list uh accidentally it is obviously not a traditional flower but i had so many volunteer tomatoes from just uh tomatoes that fell on the ground before and these were cherry these were yellow cherry tomatoes and one day i was about to weed them when i started thinking hey maybe the florists will actually be interested in this because they buy raspberry greens with raspberries on there they buy blueberry greens with the green berries and i remember how popular those two greens were with the florists so i said let me try blue let me try the tomatoes i sold every single stem i basically uh, could have sold more if I had more and I didn't. So that was at $112 that I sold to florists. And next year, if there's any volunteers, I will keep them in and continue selling them. I mean, I fetched a high price per stem. I think it was, uh, anywhere around like $1.80 to $2 and 65 cents, depending on how many of the cherry tomatoes were on there. So super profitable and basically paid for all of my vegetable seeds. Now, I said that one was the last one on my list. I do want to mention that there were definitely spring crops that made it worthwhile for me to keep. They were just not necessarily the most profitable because one, I didn't get a ton of stems in year one or two because I'm growing outside and I'm selling to the florists. Uh, how do you say it? My quality of stems isn't as great as those who grow them in a high tunnel. So foxglove is a really good example. I got a good flush of foxglove. They're still going to be pumping out stems next year definitely profitable just my foxglove didn't look as great as some of the foxglove that were grown in high tunnels those were super super tall but i've come to learn that shorter foxglove is not a bad thing sometimes people don't want like three foot tall foxglove right they want to put it into a small hand tied bouquet so there's still a place for that kind of foxglove it just fetches a little bit less per stem so foxglove sweet william was another one of them sweet william is a great workhorse i really relied on it for my mother's day sales technically sweet william really should be on the most profitable list i actually don't know why i didn't put it on there but that is one where it will perennialize it will come back again and that one was one of it was an unexpected favorite during the season so that leads us to our loser list the least profitable and this one is pretty simple. There's four crops on here. Before I wanna talk about the four crops, I wanna talk about why holistically they were unprofitable besides the fact that I didn't sell many of them. In fact, if anything, that is just a drop in the loss bucket compared to the opportunity cost that they cost me. So all of the ones that are gonna appear on this list are actually a cold loving, plants that will uh that will perennialize so the reason why this becomes a detriment is because when they become a failed crop you start thinking to yourself maybe i'll get a second flush out of them there's already that sunk cost there and maybe when i get that second flush then i'll be able to sell those stems maybe i'll be able to sell more next year the fallacy with that is twofold one opportunity cost of not using a space productively because now you've got basically plants that aren't producing sitting there for a few months longer after months of not producing. And two, more importantly for me, weeds. When you don't have a productive plant that is actively growing and really like taking up space and smothering out weed seeds, you're gonna get weeds. So I spent a ton of time weeding the non-productive areas versus focusing on growing. That was like my biggest learning this year, which is one, if something is not going to produce well, just yank it out, flip that bed, completely flip it. Don't try to hold on hope. So that brings me to the flowers that I'm going to talk about. We've got snaps, feverfew, and rubecchia that all fall into this category. 
where snaps last year was on my most profitable list. This year it went down to this part of the list because it got overtaken by thrips. My snaps, my fever few, and my um, and my Rudbeckia all got thrips. And we had an unseasonably dry and hot June, which really accelerated the growth of the thrips exponentially. I didn't manage it enough. And those thrips actually got on other stuff like nigella, uh, even um, some other crops that typically don't get thrips. I mean, typically everything can get thrips, but thrips like to stay in snaps. I had so many thrips on my snaps that they were crawling outside of the snaps and not just staying in the throat. So I said to myself, hey, if I cut these all down, maybe I'll get a second flush in the fall. It did not happen. The snaps just never fully came back, even though I've gotten second flushes before. They were choked out by the weeds. Same thing with the Rubeckia. I mean, I got some Rubeckia. They were just super, super short. I might have used a few stems here and there, but not enough to justify the space that they took and the amount of time I spent weeding after I had cut them down and basically given the entire bed sunlight for things to germinate. Uh, the fever few, I ended up ripping out two of the three varieties that I grew and I kept a few of the ones that I liked, which is the single magic ball variety. Yeah, I got a few stems in the fall and yeah, they will perennialize. They're also perennializing in an unfortunate space where I probably need to move them because we want to get the tractor in. So all in all, I spent a lot more labor and time uh, managing these four crops than, than I should have is, is what I'm trying to say. So I guess the takeaway from here is if you've got a big space, um, in some ways, this is an easier fallacy to fall into because you're like, I have the space to be able to do this, right? So remember, I was not intending on doing a lot of warm summer annuals. If I had intentionally wanted to grow zinnias and cosmos, maybe I would have saved myself from this and actually made more money out of that space. Uh, but it is what it is. And next year, I'm not going to let that happen to me. Um, two other crops on this list. One is sea holly. Sea holly is one of those crops where I think there's potential because now the sea holly has grown big enough where I think they're going to help smother out weeds next year. Um, and these sea holly already look massive. Some of the ones that I didn't uh, take out self-seeded, so I got some other sea holly seedlings coming up. This is a crop that can fetch a lot of money. This year I only made $80 because I was told that if you don't pinch the central stem when it comes up, you're going to get a giant stalk. And I don't know if this is true for perennialized sea holly and not necessarily for first year sea holly, but what ended up happening was I didn't get the greatest stem length for the pinched uh, sea holly. So let me know in the comments below what your experience is. Um, next year I might try to do half and half, but Regardless, uh, I still was able to sell some, so I, I at least made back the price of the plugs. But again, spent a lot of time weeding around the area uh, because it, it got overtaken by weeds, especially by the time July rolled around. And the last one on this list is ranunculus, of course. So ranunculus, I didn't really give it a true chance because my goal was to overwinter them. I did start them in raised beds here in this spot where it's just grass right now. So we we unexpectedly undertook a septic project when we put up this pole barn. When we put in the permit with the town, they saw the failed inspection from the house inspection that we did when we were buying the house. We eventually came to a concession with the seller, but didn't get the septic fixed because we couldn't agree what was wrong with it. And the septic technically was still working at the time. So we took that project on, which meant that this entire area had to be excavated. So I had to move those ranunculus in March when they were just starting to put on growth and that really set them back. And then the ranunculus for the spring crop started flowering that flowered basically a few weeks postpartum. And I just never got around to like really fertilizing them and taking care of them. Rabbits were munching on them. So I didn't get a great crop out of them, but obviously it's a crop that I think has potential. I'm actually trying to get winter ranunculus. And if I'm to be completely honest, it's a profitable crop for me because I unexpectedly am able to sell corms to other people and it offsets any risk that I have in terms of not getting a crop out in the field. So for all those reasons, ranunculus technically is 
on both sides of the list, if that makes sense. Um, but we'll see how I do with the winter ranunculus and how I do planting in the pots and crates for the winter ranunculus is going to dictate what I do for my spring crop. I already try to overwinter some outside. They've already gotten munched by the rabbits. It is what it is at this point. I'm not going to have much to overwinter except for those that naturally popped up meaning they popped up from my spring succession that I didn't take out and they started uh, they started shooting up leaves in the fall and I'm just gonna keep them in. I'm gonna cover them to the best that I can and we'll see if they give me a crop for, this, for next spring. All right, so that's it. That was probably a lot that I threw at you. Again, the intent of this video isn't to necessarily say like, hey, uh, tulips are super, super profitable for Jesse. So why don't I also grow tulips too? In fact, tulips for a lot of people are not profitable and they are considered a loss lead. For me, that loss lead was profitable because primarily of the press I was able to generate. And if I'm to be honest, the YouTube content that I was able to generate, right? So there's those intangibles that you have to weigh when it comes to thinking about profitability per crop. Uh, the other piece is that labor is ultimately going to be the biggest dictator of whether or not something is profitable. And again, I didn't do a good job putting a numerical value on labor, but I felt like I had enough information in my head to be able to ascertain, hey, was this, pro was this crop truly profitable based off of the numbers that I'm seeing when I factor in lab labor? Or is it kind of just like, like a misnomer uh, that on paper it looks profitable and I think it's profitable profitable, but in reality, it isn't. The goal for me each year is to add on another layer of tracking labor and those kind of cost related numbers so that I can get better at assessing profitability. But I think that the most important thing for all of us to do right now is reflect back. What did you grow this year? What was highly, highly productive? What was like set it and forget it? What made you the most amount of sales with the least amount of effort? Uh, and then of course, what did you enjoy growing and not growing? So for example, I did not grow gomfrina this year. I freaking hate gomfrina. I hate harvesting it. I still have like PTSD from harvesting it, right? I will never grow gomfrina. In fact, I sent my seeds to someone else uh, in my hatred of gomfrina. Um, but I also do not grow zinnias this year because I had so much powdery mildew. Now I had some volunteer zinnias and of course they were fine this year. I might be growing a few more zinnias next year because they do well at the co-op. And this is what I'm saying, that your sales outlet will also dictate what makes sense to grow and what doesn't make sense. So every single year, the list is probably gonna change. Uh, the one other thing I wanna talk about is my Patreon. So thank you for those who have supported me through my Patreon. This is a great way to support me if any of my videos have been helpful for you. There will be a gated post for my Patreon uh, subscribers or uh, supporters who, uh, who are able to basically access how much I was able to sell per stem uh, roughly for the florists on the wholesale side and on the retail side. So you can kind of get a sense for just what the numbers are gonna be able to fetch. Again, I am in New Jersey, so it might look different for people elsewhere. I would always say triangulate uh, what you see wholesale prices from the Boston Ornamental Terminal Sheet, sign up from a local wholesaler. Maybe there's also a co-op by you that you can see, but if you wanna see my specific numbers, I will have that in a post. And if you want access to that post, the link is below. Um, it's for $5 a month or for the cost of a fancy coffee, you'll get access to content like this that accompanies YouTube videos. So not all YouTube videos will have accompanying content, but some of them will. And I will also put updates once in a while. So for example, another great post was I did a video on receiving my tulips and what I look for in terms of bulbs uh, and what looks like a bad bulb versus a good bulb. I did an in-depth post with pictures to show what is good and what is bad. So it might be of interest to you. Anyway, let me know if you have any questions in the comments below. What were your most and least profitable crops this year? That will help a lot of other viewers and I will see you in the next video.